guys and welcome back to my channel for another serial killer spotlight video where this month I'm focusing on a serial killer that you may not have actually heard of before. This is Nanny Doss or sometimes known as the Giggling Granny. She's also known as the Lonely Hearts Killer, the Black Widow and the Lady Bluebeard and this seemingly sweet looking old lady is responsible for at least 11 deaths, possibly many many more. So Nanny Doss was born Nancy Hazel in Blue Mountain, Alabama in 1905. Nanny was a childhood nickname for Nancy that just kind of stuck throughout her entire life. She was one of five children, she had three sisters and one brother. And there's not loads to report from her childhood, obviously this was over 100 years ago now, so reports are a little bit here and there. Um, her father, as many were at the time, was very forceful and controlling and there are lots of reports saying that he actually molested Nanny when she was a child. Her and her sisters were never allowed to wear makeup or attractive clothing because ironically he was worried that men would come and molest them. At age 7 she received a head injury as many of the serial killers I talk about in this series do at some point in their life. She was travelling on a train with the family at age 7 when the train suddenly stops and Nanny goes flying forward and hits her head very very hard on a metal pole in the carriage. It's likely that from this she sustained a injury to her frontal lobe which is a very common serial killer injury and it's reported that after this her entire personality changed. She went from being a really like happy bubbly seven year old girl just very withdrawn and quiet all the time and she suffered with constant headaches and blackouts for the rest of her life. By the time Nanny was in her mid-teens and despite her father's apparent efforts to prevent this, Nanny had been molested by a string of local men in the village and apparently she went to her father and told him what was going on and he just completely dismissed it and said like you're lying, you're making this up. And Nanny dreamed of romance, possibly because she was treated so badly by men her entire life. All she wanted was that fairy tale romance. She loved to read romance magazines and romance books, and she just dreamed of a guy who would one day treat her right. She never attended school growing up because she was expected to help out on her father's farm, so she literally taught herself to read by reading her mother's romance novels and the Lonely Hearts columns in the newspaper. It would help her escape her real life and would transport her to all of these different worlds but this combined with her father's abuse inevitably gave her a very skewed view of romance. So at the age of 16 in 1923 after just four months of dating Nanny marries her first husband Charlie Braggs. They'd met at the linen factory where they were both working at the time and they got married very soon after. Nanny and Charlie move in together and Charlie brings along his very protective mother. Charlie was an only child and his mother apparently was incredibly clingy. Whatever her son did, she had to be there, she had to know about it. And Nanny apparently said that her mother-in-law ended up taking over her entire life. Between 1923 and 1927, Nanny gives birth to four daughters, which is very intense in a very short period of time. Um, she can't cope, she starts drinking a lot, she's chain smoking, and Charlie and Nanny are constantly cheating on each other. Like, this just is not a happy marriage in any sense of the word. Charlie would apparently just disappear for days on end, leaving Nanny at home with their four daughters and his mother. But then in 1927, two of their daughters, just months apart from each other, would both mysteriously die from food poisoning, and it was their two middle daughters. Um, Charlie said that each morning he left for work and the girls seemed perfectly healthy, perfectly fine. He'd return home, and they'd be dead. Nanny would say that shortly after eating breakfast the girls had convulsions and they ended up dying. But luckily for the family they had life insurance and so a few months after each death they suddenly get a check-in and Nanny did play the role of a grieving mother very very well. Nobody suspected anything but she did seem very happy when these checks came in with a payout for the deaths of their daughters. And Charlie was very suspicious of his wife. He didn't trust her at all. So Charlie packs up, takes Melvina and disappears off for quite a few months, leaving Nanny at home with their youngest daughter Florine and his mother. Mysteriously, just a few weeks after Charlie left, his mother was dead. A year later, Charlie returns back at Nanny's doorstep with Melvina and hands her back over and he's also with his new love interest, a divorcee and his love interest child and Charlie demands a divorce and Nanny gives it to him. Nanny decides to pack up their home and she moves back in with her parents for a few weeks before moving to a nearby town and 
apparently starting over. Now alone, Nanny turns to the Lonely Hearts column in the local newspaper. Now you don't really see Lonely Hearts columns that often anymore. It was basically a section in the newspaper where people could write in and sort of say, hey, I'm single, I'm looking for someone, or like write what they were looking for as somebody else and you could contact them. And it's basically how like quite a lot of people ended up getting together. Um, and so Nanny starts trolling all of these columns looking for someone. She responds to a 23 year old man called Frank Carlson and you've got to remember at this point as well Nanny is still in her early 20s herself um, and her and Frank have a romance and they end up married in 1929 him moving in with Nanny, Melvina and Florine. Pretty soon after they get married Nanny realises that her new husband is a drunk and is in huge amounts of debt. He's constantly getting himself into fights in bars, he's constantly spending nights in jail and he's got a criminal record for assault. She's not happy but the marriage actually ends up being her longest marriage and it lasts for 16 years. In this time Melvina grows up and she ends up getting married herself in 1943 giving birth to a son called Robert Haynes. Two years later she gives birth again this time to a little daughter and Nanny assists with the birth. It was a hard labour and Melvina by the end of it was absolutely exhausted, she's barely awake, she's all drugged up on ether, she's groggy and she's lying in bed as her mother, Nanny, sits next to her holding her newborn daughter. And she's sort of like drifting in and out of sleep. But just as she falls asleep, she swears that she sees something. She swore that she saw her mother take a hat pin and push it into her daughter's skull. But being so groggy, she didn't have the energy to do anything about it at the time. And when she wakes up, she's told that her daughter is dead. If you're not sure what a hat pin is, I put a picture of one up on the screen now. They're incredibly long pins that are used to hold hats into place, as you would expect. Um, but they're like not little pins that you would sort of think of. They're just very, very long and they could easily pierce a baby's soft skull. Melvina asks her husband and her sister Florine what's happened to her daughter. And they simply tell her that Nanny told them that the baby had died but they themselves had noticed that Nanny was holding a hat pin in her hand at the time. Melvina and her husband can't cope with the tragic loss of their newborn daughter, and so they eventually separate from the stress. And Melvina begins a new relationship with a soldier whom Nanny really, really hated. She did not like this relationship at all, and she made that very clear. Um, one day Nanny and Melvina had a particularly bad argument over this soldier and so Melvina goes off to stay at her father Charlie's house for a few days to cool down, leaving Robert with her mum. Unsurprisingly, on July 7th, 1945, Robert mysteriously dies. The official cause of death was diagnosed as asphyxia from unknown causes. And it just so happened that a few weeks before Robert died, Nanny had taken out a life insurance policy on him and she collects a $500 payout shortly after. I couldn't find any more information on Robert's death apart from asphyxia from unknown sources. So he probably choked something like that, but even the coroner didn't know. So at this time, Nanny is still married to Frank. And on the day of Japan's surrender to the Allies in World War II, Frank goes out to celebrate. He comes home reportedly very late at night and rapes Nanny and she's done at this point. The next day she goes out into the garden where she discovers that Frank the drunk has buried a whiskey jar in the garden. So she just decides to top it up with a bit of rat poison. By the evening Frank was dead. So two husbands down and Nanny's not about to give up on her search for love. So she starts looking through the Lonely Hearts column again. And at one point she's traveling in Lexington, North Carolina, where she meets a man called Arlie Lanning. It seems like Nanny has a type though, because Arlie was also an alcoholic womanizer, just like her last husband. Everything she didn't like in Frank, she also found in Arlie. But throughout this marriage, Nanny would reportedly be the one to disappear on many, many occasions. Sometimes she'd disappear for weeks or months at a time. Both of them constantly cheated on each other and it seems like both of them knew they were cheating on each other, but it was just like a mutual thing. They were just like, go off, do your own thing and Nanny will come back whenever she feels like it. But when Nanny did return back home to Lexington, she was the doting housewife. She was an average church goer. She was close to the minister and all of the churchy families in the town. People were actually jealous of her. They were jealous of her housekeeping skills. Apparently she had laundry that smelt incredible all the time and she would never really give away her secret. And she was just the perfect wife in every way, according to the rest of the people living in Lexington. So they looked at Nanny and saw this perfect wife. And they looked at Arlie 
who was well known to be flirting with every single woman in the town. And they felt sorry for her. And then one day in 1950, Ali suddenly dies, his cause of death listed as heart failure. He was a very heavy drinker and there'd been a bad flu virus spreading around Lexington at the time, so nobody thought it was suspicious when Ali died and no autopsy was performed. But of course, Nanny had poisoned him with rat poison. The entire town, literally every single person in the town, shows up to Ali's funeral in support of Nanny, who played the role of the grieving wife perfectly. Once again, Nanny gets a big payout from the life insurance, but that isn't enough for her this time. She wants the house, only the house has been left to Arlie's sister in his will. So she decides to burn it down. And although the house was left to Arlie's sister in the will, the house insurance was under Nanny's name. So she gets a very decent payout, one for the life insurance and one for the house insurance. Almost hilariously, Nanny had become very obsessed with TV in the few years prior to this. Her TV was basically her entire life. It seems she'd moved from her romance novels to just living for these TV shows. And she never missed an episode of her shows as she called them. She was obsessed. She was always at the front of the TV. She'd get really, really angry if anybody interrupted her. And mysteriously, on the day the house just happened to burn down, the TV just happened to be in for a repair. Purely by coincidence, of course. After this, Nanny moves in temporarily with her mother-in-law, Arlie's mum, who was suffering with a broken hip. And her mother-in-law mysteriously dies. So Nanny goes and moves in with her own sister, Dovey, who was apparently dying of cancer and was bedridden at the time. She died very soon after Nanny moved in. So now Nanny was on the search for a fourth husband, who she finds in the form of Richard L. Morton, which she finds on a dating service called the Diamond Circle Club. And the two get married in 1952 in Kansas. And Nanny's mother, Lou, actually moves in with them shortly after they get married because Nanny's father has died, Lou's all on her own, and so she needs someone to look after her. Um, Lou gets very, very ill just a few days after moving in with Nanny. She's suffering with severe stomach cramps before eventually just dropping dead. Now, this husband, Richard, wasn't an alcoholic like Nanny's last couple of husbands, but he was a womanizer. This was a very short-lived marriage as Richard succumbed to a mysterious illness just months later. Apparently he would say to Nanny that he was just popping down the shop and then he'd be gone for five, six hours. And when Nanny would question him as to where he'd been, his reply would just be, oh, I dawdled, I guess. Nanny investigated and found out that he was cheating on her with pretty much every other woman in the town. And so she poisons him in April 1953. But it doesn't take her long to find her next husband, her fifth and final husband, the one who would prove to be her downfall, Samuel Doss, who she ends up marrying in June 1953. So literally two months later, um, he would prove to be her undoing because Samuel was clean cut, decent, he was a church going man and he was a mile away from all of her previous husbands. He'd lost his wife and nine children in a tornado that had engulfed Madison County in Arkansas. So he was just looking for love, looking for someone and he found that in Nanny. But he disapproved of her romance novels and her TV shows. He didn't approve of anything that was non-educational or non-enlightening. And so Nanny, ironically, found him really boring. He didn't prove to be a challenge like the rest of her husbands. And so she decides to kill him. But before she decides to kill him, she does actually just try to return to Alabama, which she does do, only Samuel promises her that if she came back, he would sign over his checking account to her. So she decides to head back and she also takes out two life insurance policies on him with her as the benefactor. Soon after, she poisons him in the September. But Samuel doesn't die straight away and he's actually just suffering with severe flu-like symptoms and he's rushed to the hospital where they diagnose him with a severe digestive tract infection. He manages to survive and is in hospital for two weeks before returning home. By the time he's sent home, he is pretty much healthy again. He's well on the way to a full recovery. So on the first night home, Nanny celebrates and cooks him a nice home-cooked meal laced with arsenic and he's dead just hours later. But this time, people noticed. Samuel's doctors were alarmed that he died so suddenly when just a few hours earlier, he was showing that he was pretty much better. 
So they order an autopsy. It didn't take the medical examiner long to realise that Samuel's organs were full of arsenic and the police were alerted immediately. And reportedly there was enough arsenic in his system to have killed 40 horses. Of course, as soon as the police are notified, Nanny is their one and only suspect. She is the only one who would actually be feeding him to give him arsenic. And so the police head straight round to her house and arrest her. There's no big investigation here. Like, they know it's most likely the wife. They look into her past a little bit and see that four out of her five husbands have mysteriously died. Honestly, it's a wonder that no one clocked on sooner. But Nanny was constantly moving. She was moving town to town, state to state, and everything was paperback then. There weren't these computerized systems that would flag things like this up. And I would assume that she was using a different life insurance company for every policy that she was taking out. So the authorities would have had a hard time to realize what she was doing because she was moving around so much. Nanny is interrogated by the police and at first refuses to speak. She says, my conscience is clear. I married these men because I love them. They interview her literally all night and she gives them nothing. But as news of Nanny's arrest spreads, people start to put two and two together. People are coming to the police saying like, yeah, her daughter mysteriously died and then her other daughter mysteriously died and her grandson mysteriously died. And yeah, there was this one thing that her ex-husband said about how he would never want to eat anything that she made because he didn't trust her. And things just started to come to light. Apparently she refused to speak about anything at all until the police bribed her. They told her that if she spoke that they would give her a romance novel to have in her cell and after this she started speaking pretty quickly. She confesses to the murders of eight people. Frank Harrelson, Arlie Lanning, Richard Morton, Samuel Doss, her sister Dovey, her grandson Robert and Arlie Lanning's mother. She never actually confessed to the murders of her own mother, her two daughters or her newborn granddaughter but it's widely thought that she did do this. Nanny gets her nickname, the Giggling Granny, from her demeanour throughout these police interviews. The police said it was very disconcerting because while she was talking about these murders, she was literally sat there with a smile on her face, giggling to herself about it. She seemed completely unfazed, almost not able to understand the severity of what she had done. She blamed all of her actions on her love of romance novels, saying they gave her an unrealistic expectation of men. She wanted to find the perfect husband and the man just didn't exist. She said to the police, that's about it. I was searching for the perfect mate, the real romance of life and none of her husbands lived up to her expectation. Ironically, Samuel Doss was probably the closest one to what she wanted, but he wasn't exciting enough for her. And instead of getting divorced and going through all the rigmarole and the paperwork, she decided that it was just easier to kill them, as she knew she'd get a life insurance payment for it. Her reason for killing Samuel Doss was she didn't know what she was getting herself into. Apparently, he annoyed her. Richard Morton, she said, had been making me mad, shining up to other women. On Frank Harrelson, she said, I found out that he was a jailbird and a drunkard. I have to think that the murders were pretty much inspired by the life insurance payout she knew she'd get. Divorce would cost her money. If she'd murdered them, then she would get money. But clearly she did have these murderous tendencies from a young age. She killed her two young daughters when she was in her very early 20s just because she didn't want to raise them anymore because she couldn't cope with having four children under the age of four. On some occasions, like I said, she said that the romance novels were to blame. On other occasions, she said that it was the childhood trauma to blame or her head injury. And I would say that the head injury probably did have something to do with it. Shockingly as well, at the time that Nanny was actually arrested, she had a sixth husband ready and lined up. A man in North Carolina who had fallen for her and apparently she'd already been sending him baked goods in the mail. He was apparently begging her to meet and luckily for him, she got arrested before they could. Unsurprisingly, the judge failed to see the funny side of Nanny's crimes. She was prosecuted by the state of Oklahoma on the murder case of Samuel Doss only. This was the only one she's ever tried for. She was never tried for the other 10 murders, but it's widely thought that she did commit them and she confessed to quite a lot of them. At the age of 50, on the 17th of May, 1955, Nanny Doss pleads guilty to the murder of her husband Samuel Doss and she has been declared mentally sane by the courts at this time. She's sentenced to life imprisonment and the state don't actually pursue the death penalty for her because of her gender, because she was a woman, which I find 
absolutely ridiculous. She spends the rest of her life in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary and apparently she remained happy and cheerful throughout the remainder of her life while she was in jail. She would apparently tell people about her crimes while still laughing with that smile on her face. She'd make jokes about her murders all the time and she worked in the prison laundry. At one point she requested to actually work in the prison kitchen but luckily she was declined. Far from any kind of real justice in this case, Nanny Doss peacefully dies of leukemia on June 2nd, 1965. She never once showed any remorse for a single one of her crimes. She was a sociopath, clearly devoid of any real emotion or feelings about her actions, which makes it even stranger when she says that these romance novels were the reason that she committed these crimes. She committed them because she was in the search of the perfect husband. But even if she found this perfect husband, I don't think she ever would have been able to truly have feelings for that person. If she can kill her own children, her own grandchildren, then she's clearly devoid of something. I mean, what reason would she have had to kill her newborn granddaughter other than just pure curiosity? She probably was stood there with a baby in one hand and a hat pin in the other and thought, I wonder what will happen if I do this. So she did it and never showed any remorse for it whatsoever. She is the female killer stereotype in every single way. She's looking for this love, this big romance, and she's using poison as her weapon of choice. I mean, that literally is the female killer stereotype in a nutshell. And that is the story of Nanny Doss. She's only the second female serial killer that I've actually covered in the series so far. Um, let me know down below who you'd like to see me talk about next month. Um, give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel, and thank you so much for watching. Bye guys.